Virginia. I'm Cindy Peterson, the museum's executive director. Thank you for joining us and a warm welcome to students, staff, and faculty at HBCUs across the nation, our regional universities, and local high schools. We are excited to present an exclusive conversation with Ruth E. Carter in her exhibition, Afrofuturism and Costume Design. Welcome, Ruth. Thank you, Cindy. I'm really excited to have this conversation. Well, we're excited that you are here and we're so excited to share this exhibition with our community, our region, and around the nation. Your exhibition, Ruthie Carter, Afrofuturism and Costume Design, on view here at the Taubman, showcases your career spanning uh, more than 30 years in Hollywood with work on groundbreaking movies such as Do the Right Thing, Amistad, and Black Panther, among many more. Since Afrofuturism is a theme that ties so much of your work together, can you share with us what your definition is of Afrofuturism? Sure, um, I just feel like this happened organically um, from the start, uh, we were making films that had representation. And uh, Afrofuture does have something to do with representation. Um, during uh, the time of Do the Right Thing and School Days, uh, we were actually you know, projecting our images on screen that we didn't get to see uh, as much. Uh, so when I feel like I'm on the set uh, where I'm working with directors like Ava DuVernay or Spike Lee, um, I'm embodying the Afro future in, in the storytelling. They are um, actually encouraging the Afro future in, in the direction because, you know, they're always thinking about how, um, how the image of the people or how the historical significance of the scene um, did impact us and will impact us for our future. But Afrofuturism um, does have a lot to do with technology. So. Uh, when you think about Black Panther and how we took the tribes and we were inspired by a lot of the different um, techniques and technologies that they used in the past, we also infused technology to bring it together in a futuristic model. Well, and I know that you also encourage everyone to think about what Afrofuturism means, mm -hmm. and I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, and your career really has focused so much on lifting up black voices and telling those important stories mm -hmm. that have historically been left untold. Mm -hmm. Has that been a conscious decision on your part? And what stories would you like to help tell next? Mm, that's wonderful. Um, I, I tell uh, the director's vision. Um, uh, I get a script and I read it and I, I hope to be inspired. I hope to be excited about the script because the storytelling does come from the writer and from the director. What we try to do is infuse authenticity. Uh, we try to infuse uh, the technology. Um, as with Queen Ramonda, we 3D printed her crown and her shoulder mantle. And as you move forward, those kinds of technologies, they become obsolete. So you're always thinking about what can I do next time? You know, what will this new story that I'm giving bring to the table? And how can I project that image in a real forward thinking way? 
Which you do so well. So I, I enjoy that 3D printing connection that connects mm -hmm. across uh, fashion in the digital age sure. and telling those stories. Um, you're an alma mater of uh, Hampton University yes. here in Virginia. Yes. And tell us how your HBCU experience was so transformative for you personally mm -hmm. and professionally as we have students from HBCUs mm -hmm. across the nation viewing today. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, well, Hampton was a family school. Uh, once I got there, my cousins were there, my <laughs> uncle worked on campus, my aunt went to Hampton. So I, it really was truly my home by the sea. Uh, and it also gave me a, a field to flourish in. I started out as an education major, special education, and but I always loved the theater. The theater, the little theater on the campus was a place where I could go and see my creative side. And as I, as I became involved in the theater programs at Hampton, I started to realize that that was the thing that I really wanted to do. And, and it was opened up to me. And I really do have Hampton to thank for allowing me to study costume design. Wonderful. Well, you flourished um, beyond. And, you know, speaking of college, we have received questions from around the country from students and faculty. Well, I don't think anybody really knows when they apply to college if that's going to be the one thing that they end up doing, what, 35, uh, 35 years later, 60 movies later. Um, but you, you, you are hopeful. Um, I started out, like I said, as a, as a special education major. I was, uh, was going to be a teacher. I come from a legacy of that, too. Uh, and I have discovered while at Hampton that I, I could be a costume designer, and that's what I wanted to pursue. So it was a step-by-step -step process. Well, and I think you're still teaching. So you, you know, I've learned so much through this exhibition, mm -hmm. through the presentation mm -hmm. of costume design mm -hmm. and the, you know, in, in historical research and in-depth, mm -hmm. uh, you know, possibilities that you present to mm -hmm. our visitors. So, nice. Ruth, you are a trailblazer in so many ways, and among your top honors. You've earned more than 25 nominations and won more than 30 national and international awards for your work. How impressive. And, and you're the first black person to win an Academy Award for costume design, as we see your Academy Award-winning dress here in the exhibition. And earlier this month, you were honored with the Vanguard Award for costume design presented by NAACP Image Awards, the first time this award has ever been presented. Congratulations. Thank you, Cindy. Um, I do stand on the shoulders of many um, seamstresses in the past that clothed uh, presidents and abolitionists great literary giants and didn't dare to dream to be a costume designer. And I'm, you know, honored that in the, in the NAACP would give me the Vanguard Award because I think those, it also honors those people that came before me. Um, but I have, I have a lot of Vanguard directors to thank for um, giving me these opportunities like Spike Lee and Ava DuVernay and Ryan Coogler. So um, it's, you know, it has to start somewhere and, I, and we, we just don't honor our, our, um, our forefathers uh, in these, these ways. Um, when I think of Ann Lowe who designed Jackie Kennedy's wedding dress or Mildred Blount, who was a black woman who made so many hats in Gone with the Wind, and they were relatively unknown. So uh, they blazed the trail for me, and so I'm honored to accept that Vanguard Award in honor of them. Oh, I really don't feel like there are ever anything that's a mistake. Like you actually learn from the mistakes more than you learn from the successes, I, I feel. So um, I can't really uh, say that there's any one thing that I, that I would suggest that they do differently. I, 
I came through the, the process at a different time. Um, independent film was just burgeoning. Um, there was this uh, need to um, be independent and tell these stories. And so I was lucky enough to bounce back and forth between New York and, and Los Angeles for like 10 years. I'd work for Robert Townsend and Keenan Wayans and I'd do five heartbeats or BAPS, and then I'd go back to New York and I'd do Mo Better Blues or Crooklyn with Spike. And maybe that's not exactly the way it's going to happen today. So my advice would be to look at the landscape. There are many more independent filmmakers than there was when I started. And I was one of very few costume designers that wanted to uh, do this profession in film. Now there are, uh, there are many more. The competition is a little steeper. Um, but I think if you do the work, if you focus, if you um, find the avenues and you stick with it, um, that's what I did. And so I'm just going to say, you know, do what I did in a macro way. Uh, you know, focus, find your resources, find your film family. Your film family will guide you through what your next steps are. Well, thank you, Ruth, for that advice for, for students and all, all around. And it leads us to another question about mentoring. Yeah. I had really wonderful mentors in college. Um, they were instructors. Uh, um, our black theater instructor was Linda Bolton Smith. Um, her father taught at Hampton. Her mother was an art teacher at Hampton. Uh, she was my black theater uh, instructor and, and mentor. And, uh, you know, she gave me a lot. Um, there were several um, um, ways that I learned about myself as an artist through my mentors at Hampton. Um, uh, also, I was in the acting program. So uh, Rex Ellis was our uh, acting professor at Hampton. He's uh, been at the Smithsonian now at the new museum there and uh, was really uh, very, I was a very active theater student. So my mentors saw something in me that they felt that I could you know, pursue. Uh, whether it was acting or costume design. I think I, I kind of felt like I was a pretty good actress on the stage, so I enjoyed it. Um, but it was costume design that kind of took over everything. And there was no costume design field in the theater department. There was no instructor actually teaching that. that. So I made up my own curriculum there. And Hampton allowed me to flourish in that way. Uh, so I did all the plays and, and uh, my instructors that were teaching other disciplines were the ones that gave me the critiques and gave me the encouragement. Well, that was very forward thinking of the university to mm -hmm. allow for that growth, mm -hmm. to allow for that innovation to, and that, that creative sense that mm -hmm. you brought to the table. Well, a costume designer actually does a lot of pre-work. Uh, There's a lot of preparation. Um, I'm having three or four fittings with actors for one costume. Um, by the time I get the costume and the actor together on the set, kind of my work is done. I, I don't want to have to really make everybody uptight by making adjustments to a costume. That does happen, you know, that's uh, inevitable, but you really want them to be minor. So, so my role is to shepherd the actor to the set in costume, um, you know, support their good feeling about how they're gonna perform in that costume. Um, the director has seen it already, there are no surprises. Um, and I'm at that point, I'm looking at the composition, I'm looking at the set, um, and, and I'm enjoying the costume uh, working on on the film or working on the project. I'm, I'm actually um, hopefully very pleased. And if not, then 
I'm, I'm sort of making sense of it. Well, that goes to your attention to detail as well. And, you know, talk a little bit about that. And, you know, can you tell us about that process and why it's so important to you? Not only that attention to detail that you see on the, on the set, but the historical in-depth research mm -hmm. that you do. And we see it in this exhibition. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I learned how to research from my theater work. Um, most of the time, the theater work is uh, big period pieces. When I was at the Santa Fe Opera, we were doing the, te the Tempest and the English Cat, and we had to know a lot about uh, the history of costume design. So um, I came into this field uh, with a sense of um, research. Uh, so uh, when I was able to pattern how I would research these films on my own, um, it was a, a joy to bring Teeny Harris to the table for Thurgood Marshall as uh, he went around Philadelphia photographing people in the 1940s or for Rosewood looking at the work of James of Andersey from the 1920s. And, and I also collected a lot of research on my own. I have a collection of ebony magazines and I have a lot of things that I have collected just because of the, you know, the, the history that you see when you have some of these photographers that are all together in one publication. So, um, you know, that's a big part of what I love about my job. And, but then it's, you have to make these images come off the page. You can research and research and research, but if you can't implement that research in a real practical way, if you can't build that costume with the right texture, with the right color, and also select the, the thing that you see for the right body type for the actor, um, then it's nothing. So there is this composition that happens when you're bringing the research together with the storytelling and the actor. We're airing today, only days after the anniversary of Bloody Sunday, and the march from Selma to Montgomery that ultimately led to the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. One of the films you helped bring to life is Selma, which shows that pivotal moment in time for our nation. Tell us more about working on that film and what you hope that college students today learn from those history lessons. Well, I think students should know that uh, we created Selma in the way that we felt was the most authentic way that it actually happened. I mean, we went to Selma, Alabama. We marched over the actual mm -hmm. Selma Bridge. And also there were descendants from the Selma March that, that I dressed in costume that were a part of it. So during the lunch break, I was almost like interviewing them about what they remembered. They were children, but they did remember that, you know, the order of, of the way people were arranged in the march where the men were up front and the children are at the back. They knew that they were going to face this police brutality on the other side of the bridge. And, and then I learned all about, you know, peaceful protests where, you know, a lot of times they wore their hands in their pockets of their trench coats, you know, to uh, project an image of peaceful protests. So um, there's so many details to creating a historically accurate a film. We didn't want to make it a documentary, but it's very close to that. Um, at the same time, you go inside of Martin Luther King's like inner sanctum and in, into his his relationships with you know all of the people that he collaborated with, um, like Andrew Young and John Lewis, great John Lewis and uh, Annie Lee Cooper. So I'm um, you know just thrilled to have been a part of creating or recreating a historical event. And, and I think students can actually look at the film and just use it as a, a part of what else happened to bring equality to this country. Going back to HBCUs and their important role in today's society, tell us a little bit more about that, especially as a graduate from Hampton University. Um, I think that HBCUs were uh, brought into the fray because W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington had a mission for uh, uh, black 
people uh, to be uh, more empowered, um, to be more educated. Um, HBCUs were, were developed because um, blacks weren't allowed to go to many of the universities that were white universities. And um, they believed in economic empowerment. They believed that education would lead to a greater freedom for, um, for black people. And we, uh, as much as we would like to think that we have grown from there, that edict is still relevant today that through education and through uh, uh, a, a, the development of uh, ap uh, uh, historically black universities and colleges, um, there is a sense of community. There is a sense of empowerment still today. So I think what W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington wanted for us is still relevant today with HBCUs. And, and it's actually, you know, a place where, you know, collectively there is a sense of uh, camaraderie and community. And, and that's where I learned the importance of black theater. And, you know, you, I, I learned about artists and Jacob Lawrence. And it's not like you can't get that from other universities, but HBCUs, you know, historically have been set up, you know, for, um, you know, uh, uplift the race, which was W.E.B. Du Bois's, um, his uh, motto. And I think that this is still important today. Well, thank you. And you talk about that and during your journey mm -hmm. uh, and that community feel and, and your education um, through an HBCU. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's so many costumes that were in that film. Uh, they're like my kids. Uh, I can't <laughs> pick a favorite. But if I were to pick one, I think it would be the Dora Milaje costume uh, because there's so many layers to that costume. You can actually travel all over the continent of Africa. Um, there's the Indabele rings from South Africa. There's beadwork from the Turkana, which is East Africa. There's scarification. There's leather work from the Himba tribe. So there's so many elements that were used in that one costume. And, and also, um, Ryan Coogler really wanted it to empower women, um, not uh, for it, that costume not to be over, overly sexualized. So we didn't want the women of Wakanda, the Dora Milaje, the highest ranking female fighting force in Wakanda, to be in cheerleader skirts and mm. bikini tops. Um, we really wanted them to be taken seriously and in a uniform. Uh, so they, they didn't have high heels. They had flat, split-toe martial arts boots. And, um, and it really made me very proud that people could see the beauty in that costume, even though it covered the woman's body from head to toe. Uh, when we bring students and children into the exhibition, mm -hmm. we spend time in front of that costume because looking at the details, talking mm -hmm. about exactly what what you've um, portrayed there, mm -hmm. and it's it's exciting to be able to um, see and hear their reactions. Yes, and not every little girl who wants to be a superhero um, wants to you know feel like she's got her midriff out. So that's a costume that anybody can wear. And, and embody their own superhero. Well, uh, Chadwick is a very, was a very serious actor. Um, I um, dressed him in uh, Thurgood Marshall, the film called Marshall. Um, and when I found out I was going to do Black Panther, the, uh, I was on set with Chadwick Boseman, who was going to be the Black Panther. So it was a very surreal moment for me, and I didn't really want to tell him right away that they had just given me the opportunity to do that film because we really hadn't gotten that far along on Marshall. And uh, so I waited, and maybe about two weeks before the film was done, I said to Chadwick, you know, hey, I'm going to be doing Black Panther with you. And he said, oh, yeah, I already knew that. 
So it, it was an aha moment. And I, I thought, you know, this is someone who actually is very private, very peaceful, but also very gracious. Talking about Black Panther, let's take this opportunity to tour the exhibition, Ruthie Carter, Afrofuturism in Costume Design, currently on view at the Tallman Museum of Art here in Roanoke, Virginia. Yeah, so I started my career with Do the Right Thing. It's one of the first uh, films that I uh, was a part of. And we shot that in Brooklyn, New York. It was um, the place that Spike Lee grew up. And it was a protest film. Spike was responding to a lot of the things that were going on in Brooklyn, New York, in New York. Um, it was the hottest day of the summer, and Spike uh, would always say, you know, in New York, when it gets real hot, all kinds of things, you know, happen. So there were a lot of things happening in New York. We, we, were, uh, we were facing uh, some brutality that was happening in between the black neighborhoods and the Italian neighborhoods. Um, Tawana Brawley's case was presently going on. Um, there were things that, um, there were situations that were happening. So he wrote that film as a protest film and it was an independent film that didn't have much money. So we used a lot of product placement from Nike and I had to balance all of that Nike product, product placement with Afrocentric uh, fabrics because they were also very bright and saturated. And, and uh, it was the film that Rosie Perez was uh, discovered on. So you see the opening credits in Do the Right Thing and Rosie is uh, dancing to fight the power and she puts on the boxing gloves and she's boxing and dancing and bobbing and weaving. So it's an exciting opening and it's also a very important film. And, and so important so that it's really relevant today. Uh, it's, it's entered into the Library of Congress as an important film. So um, I'm really proud that I was a part of that film with Spike Lee and his vision for um, uh, producing something, a, a film of protest. We did the butler uh, in uh, New Orleans and there, we went through several decades. The, the uh, film was about um, a man who was a butler at the White House through seven presidents and who was basically like a fly on the wall, if you would, in terms of like hearing a lot of important conversations and a lot of, a lot of things that happen in our history and civil rights. He was he was uh, there to witness these decisions that were uh, discussed in the back rooms of the White House um, and seeing presidents uh, come and go and then to finally uh, see Barack Obama become president. So we were, um, we were really excited about telling this story and um, what was really hard was going through those decades and being very specific about um, the family lifestyle of, uh, of, of the Gaines family and, and what, what they meant to their community. They were pillars in their community because they were working at the White House. Malcolm X was shot in New York City uh, in 1991, and um, I was still uh, young as a filmmaker, but um, I was very excited about the Alex Haley book that we read uh, to use as our outline for uh, creating the looks of uh, Malcolm X, who went from being a street hustler to a national speaker for the Nation of Islam. And uh, in the book, it talks about a powder blue zoot suit that he, um, he, he bought uh, soon after uh, arriving in, uh, in New York. 
And uh, it's something that I always remembered about the book when I read it, that you know I really wanted to get those zoot suits right. So um, there are some menswear um, uh, catalogs and, and books that talk about the zoot suit, like how narrow it is at the ankle, how wide it is at the knee, how high the waist is. Um, it, it, they also talk about the chain that is worn with the zoot suit. It's very long. The hats are very big and they, and they had a feather in the hats. So it was, it was exciting to create uh, the zoot suits for Malcolm X and then to mirror uh, that look to what he ended up becoming as this uh, pillar in the Nation of Islam and national speaker. So when you look at the zoot suit and you look at a 1960s suit, it's very different. They're super different. They're two different eras. One's the 40s, one's the 60s. But it also does show like the trajectory of this man and what happened in his life. It's visually storytelling. So I grew up in the 70s. I was a teenager in the 70s. So doing a film like Dolomite Is My Name is like taking me back. It really takes me back to all of the uh, all of the elements that I remember about the 70s, like marshmallow shoes, knick knick shirts, double knit polyester, high waist pants, and uh, we found a fabric store that had a lot of dead stock. It was in an old warehouse of theirs, and I had heard about this uh, fabric that they had, and I went there one day and asked them if I could see it. And they took me over to an old dusty room and there was this plethora of 70s fabrics. And I think we nearly cleaned them out and they you know, were scratching their heads saying, okay, if you want it. <laughs> and we ended up making a lot of costumes for Dolomite Is My Name and, and also collecting a lot of pieces, a lot of the uh, polyester shirts that have the photo prints all over them. And it was exciting to arrive on the set and see everybody dressed uh, in the 70s. I, I went to Steven Spielberg's office to interview for Amistad and um, it was a big conference room that I was escorted into and uh, the script was top secret. So all I had was the cliff notes to Amistad because it was actually a real event that happened uh, in history. So I had my cliff notes with me and uh, there was just two, ta two chairs at the conference table. Um, I assumed one was for me and one was for Steven Spielberg and, and that was, the case, he was shooting Jurassic Park. So during the lunch break, he came over and we discussed uh, a little bit about the film, but what he said that really, uh, it surprised me, I don't know why. He said, I really loved your work in Malcolm X. And it was interesting to hear this, you know, iconic director in Hollywood um, talk about Malcolm X. So I really did appreciate that. And he said, go home and read the script and uh, let me know uh, if you'd like to work together on it. And I thought, I could just call him back from the parking lot, honestly. But um, we called him back and it was a wonderful journey um, of discovering uh, uh, what the looks were for Cinque, who was the, um, the one uh, main character that the whole... Amistad case was centered around, uh, and it was he was played by John, uh, Jaiman Hunsu, um, and we did a lot of dyeing and aging. Uh, we did a lot of recreations of things that we saw in our art history books. Uh, so when I went on and did Roots, the reboot of Roots, so I didn't do the Roots 1970. I did the Roots, the reboot. I felt like I had a running start because of my work on Amistad. So with Roots, I really did want to show more of the family story. And during that time, it was uh, for slaves on a plantation. Um, it wasn't about being dirty. Uh, they only had one outfit for the whole year, but it was wash and repair. I kept saying, 
wash and repair. And some things would get really tattered and I'd ask the seamstresses to, you know, patch and repair things um, as they would have done. So um, we also had a story, uh, color story going through roots, the indigo blue. Because once we went back to um, Sierra Leone, where the, a lot of the slaves were taken from on the west coast of Africa, you know, we discovered that they did harvest a lot of indigo. Um, and so I wanted to bring that indigo blue from Sierra Leone, where you see it very heavy in the first chapter of uh, Roots Reboot. Then when we come over to the United States and to the South, um, I wanted to keep that color going and make it like a family color. So not only did I have shawls and, um, and coats and things cut out of that blue, we also did all of the aging of the costumes with a blue cast to the color so that sometimes you might think to yourself, you know, I love the color purple. I don't know why, but I love the color purple. You have your favorite color. So I wanted that color to be something that maybe they connected to. They didn't necessarily know why, but it had a journey in the story. My second film was Amo Get You Sucker. And it was directed by Keenan Ivory Wayans in Los Angeles. And, um, you know, it was a comedy. It was a high comedy. And it was written in the script that Huggy Bear would, uh, he was playing like this big pimp from the 70s. He actually like goes to prison. And when he comes out 10, 15 years later, he puts on his old clothes that he had in the closet that's, you know, from the 70s and, you know, really wants to hold on to a lot of his fame and notoriety as a street hustler. So he exits his apartment building in his finery and everyone's laughing. Everyone's falling all over the ground laughing. But so we adored him in goldfish shoes. Uh, it was written in the script that he had these shoes that had goldfish in them. And they actually did exist. There was a football play player named Frankie uh, Faison, and he had a pair of goldfish shoes. Um, so I had never seen um, shoes with a, with a real goldfish in them. So we made them like an aquarium, and we put the goldfish in, and, and there was a little knob inside the shoe where we had to, you know, drop the fish in. But um, it turned out to be kind of like a cult classic, this film, and it's really nice to see how people still appreciate this look of this pimp with goldfish shoes. To step into the shoes of a classic like Coming to America is a lot to ask a designer to do the second version of a film that is really well loved. And there's a lot of people who watch the original uh, Coming to America, you know, once a year. I've heard all kinds of people talk about the original. So people were against it being made, remade, but we weren't remaking it. We were actually producing a film of, that was a continuation of the story. And in the first movie, you see more of uh, New York because he comes to America. And in this film, uh, Coming to America 2, or Coming to America, we are showing more of Zamunda and more of their life in Africa. Uh, so I, uh, I enjoyed uh, coming up with a lot of uh, prints and uh, embellishing fabrics and showing royalty. Um, in a way that was very different from Black Panther. I talk about uh, with Black Panther that I had to walk around and tell people this is not coming to America. It's a different aesthetic. It's a different look. And then lo and behold, I get coming to America and I have to walk around and say this is not Black Panther. They're very different. Um, so uh, there's beautiful velvets. Um, we had some things made in India where we could dye fabric and have it embellished on top. Um, we did take uh, a lot of Ankara fabrics and make really big shapes. 
because from the first film there were big shapes of uh, big sleeves, big um, uh, big galas or headdresses, and so there were a lot of things from the first film that I wanted to make sure we had in the second one because it's kind of iconic from the first film. Uh, so there was a balance there with uh, all of the characters that Eddie Murphy and Arsenio Hall uh, played in the first film that we brought into the second one, and then creating new things. So we really tried to make it our own. Uh, when I was asked to do the costumes for Black Panther, I thought, why me? Uh, I had never done a superhero film before. Um, I really wasn't a Panther comics girl. I, I, maybe the Archies was in my room or, or Little Lotta, but not the Panther. Spider-Man and the Panther co comics, those were in my brother's rooms. They weren't in my room and I couldn't touch them. I couldn't even look at them as far as they were concerned. But um, I did, uh, for the interview, um, look at a lot of images from the comics because this script was also top secret. I, there was no script that I could read to prepare for the interview. Um, but I did accumulate a massive amount of uh, images to show what Afrofuture was to me. And I went over to Marvel and, you know, Marvel's like the CIA, you know, they've got that Tony Stark, uh, you know, security going on, you know, you get an eye scan and, you know, you go in and it feels very much a secure environment. And I sat across from Ryan Coogler and Nate Moore, who was our executive on the film. And, uh, I was trying to open up my Dropbox, which wouldn't open because there's a firewall over at Marvel. And I was a little panicky because I was depending on my, to share my images to show them what my view of the aesthetic was. And Ryan sat across from me and he said, I'm really glad to meet you. I'm glad you're here to, you know, come and talk about Black Panther. You know, I, I loved Malcolm X and I was a little boy and my dad took me with him to see that film and I just remembered the costumes. So in a way, I felt like I had interviewed for Black Panther when this young director was a little boy. But we went on to um, get that Dropbox open and share images and it turned out that a lot of the images that I had collected, he had also collected. So um, we immediately had a connection. And as we went into making this film, there was a lot about the African diaspora that we wanted to, um, we wanted to show. Uh, and we had picked 12 of the tribes of Africa to be inspired by. Um, the Tuareg of Mali, the Hemba tribe, um, the Turkana, the Indibele. Um, we went all over the continent and I used a lot of things like beadwork, um, leatherwork um, to inspire the costumes. There's, there, the Dogon tribe was inspiring for the, the Jabari tribe. So, you know, we gave them this grass skirt and the, and the Dogon, they were like one of the first astronomers and they had this celebration once a year as a celebration of the solstice and they wear these grass skirts. And so Ryan thought, let's put a grass skirt on the Jabari tribe. So um, I went on to make these grass skirts and age them up. And then the, uh, the stunt players and the actors who were uh, playing the Jabari warriors came into my office and they were ginormous. They were, they were like football players. And I thought, okay, I have a little grass skirt I want you to try on. And it turned out that I could, I, I needed to put another layer underneath that skirt so that the grassy skirt on top uh, was more like an accessory. So they have a leather sheath that goes underneath the grass skirt. Um, but also the Dogon, they were uh, beautiful craftsmen. Uh, you, if you research their, their doors, for example, you'll see a lot of carvings and 
a lot of handwork. So we carve their uh, their armor pieces, their chest piece, their shoulder pieces to look like wood. It's actually not wood, but we we made it we made it out of foam and then painted it to look like wood. Then there's the panther suit. Uh, the Panther suit was uh, created by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. Uh, the pa Black Panther character was created by uh, Jack Kirby and Stan Lee back in the 60s when they felt like there needed to be a superhero in the Black community during all the civil unrest. And we created this suit that connected uh, the Panther suit to Africa because in this uh, film, we really do see how he um, interacts with people in Wakanda. We see so much of Wakanda. And we decided to put a little triangle shape on the surface texture of the suit. Um, and we called it the Okavango Triangle, which uh, represented the family, the father, the mother, and the child. And we were re really proud of that uh, surface texture. Um, because I felt like uh, we needed to really uh, connect him to the people. And, and so when he's walking um, around uh, Wakanda with the suit on, he feels like a, not just the Black Panther, but also like an African king. We have had such a positive response from the community to your exhibition here at the Tama Museum of Art, Ruth. And tell us about, you know, how that came about. Why a traveling exhibition? And, you know, what do you hope that visitors experience and take away? Well, you know, I've always been a collector um, because I'm a thespian. And people in theater, you know, they keep their costumes from one play to the next. You know, maybe it has to do with like the budgets of for theater are usually small. So, um, you know, they, 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 you learn how to store costumes. And um, because I came into film from theater, I came in with that mindset of, uh, well, we created some really great uh, ideas on this film. Let me put them away. And when we get to the next film, maybe there's something we could use from the last one. But it didn't work out that way. Every, every film, every story was so different it just ended up being a collection. Um, and we didn't keep every single thing, but we kept the key pieces. And I think it's important that the key pieces are preserved. Um, when I started, there wasn't a great appreciation for costumes. I think people were still very confused whether it was fashion or it was costume design. So the awareness that has come out of displaying and touring an exhibition of costume design has been invaluable to the uh, enlightening and the education of the community to here's a profession that you can actually make a living at, you can actually be creative in, because we only knew uh, fashion. And it's, I think, more creative than the fashion industry. Fashion industry is very highly, highly competitive and there's a lot of factors to it. This industry is a one script, one story, and the costume designer has the ability to be a storyteller. And so that's why I feel like the touring of this exhibition is important because it enlightens people to what is costume design? Well, and it definitely does that. And it's that educational lens, but it's also that expert storytelling that you bring mm -hmm. to the stage as the visitor goes through the exhibition and really leaves with you know, that enlightenment um, mm -hmm. and continuing to ask new questions. In the exhibition, the dress you wore when you accepted the Oscar is showcased. What was it like to receive the Oscar? Oh, it was pretty nerve wracking, <laughs> for to say the least. Uh, um, but there was a moment that was transformative. Um, I was nervous leading up to the red, through the red carpet and when we took our seats. But uh, when they announced that the best costume was Black Panther and I stepped on the uh, steps to go up to the stage, I just felt really good. I really felt like 
had reached this pinnacle and I was so proud that it was for Black Panther. And when I got up on the stage, I looked in front of me and Spike Lee was just sitting maybe four rows down right there in front of me. So I went off of my speech for a second and I said, you know, thank you, Spike. Thank you for my start. I hope this makes you proud. And it was the perfect moment to thank him uh, as well as uh, accepting this award, uh, being the first costume designer of color to win uh, for costume design and to have Ryan Coogler and the cast there in the audience. It just really felt right. It felt right. And so I'm very, very proud of that moment. And congratulations again. Thank you. And what is next for Ruth E. Carter? Well, you know, we just finished uh, filming Black Panther 2. Uh, that will be out in November of this year. And then I'm, I'm going to take a break. I think I deserve a break. I think so, too. <laughs> I work all the time. I work. I love what I do, so it doesn't ever feel like work. Um, but I do have other outside interests. Thank you, Ruth, for joining us for this conversation and for sharing your exhibition, Ruthie Carter, Afrofuturism and Costume Design with our community. My pleasure. Thank you. We invite each of you viewing today to see this extraordinary exhibition in person. It is on view through Sunday, April 3rd. Be sure to show your school ID for free admission. And stay tuned to learn more about our region and exciting professional opportunities for HBCU students in the beautiful Roanoke Valley, including right here at the Taubman Museum of Art. The city of Roanoke is a hub for finance, healthcare, logistics, legal, and manufacturing for all of Western Virginia. Roanoke is the home to one of Virginia's largest healthcare systems, Carillion Clinic, and the Freeland Biomedical Research Institute. We hope you will consider Roanoke for career opportunities. And now a word from our friends at Carillion Clinic. Cindy, thank you very much for that warm introduction and for this opportunity for me to be able to address historically black colleges and universities that are within five hours of Roanoke. I was really, really pleased to have the opportunity to meet Ruth Carter when she was here, to personally meet her and have an opportunity to interact with her. This was after having been able to spend time at the museum, at the Taubman Museum, looking at all of her work and all of the creativity that went into that. And then to be able to connect that with the artist, meeting Ruth, hearing her talk about her connections with Roanoke, Virginia, and nearby Bedford, uh, and all of her ties with Virginia. I was also impressed in talking with Ruth about Afrofuturism in the costume design exhibition. I'm very pleased with the position that I've occupied for the last uh, year as serving as Senior Vice President and Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer for Carillion Clinic. Close by, I also have a similar role where I serve as Senior Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the Virginia Tech Carillion School of Medicine. I have found in the 25 years that I have been here that Carillion Clinic is a great place for students to start careers or pursue graduate studies or even medical school. An overview of Carillion Clinic is this. We are the largest healthcare system in Southwest Virginia. 
we provide health care for nearly one million Virginians and West Virginians. We are an organization that has 13,200 employees, and we own and operate seven hospitals. We have more than 200 practice sites with 800 physicians. The Virginia Tech Carilion School of Medicine next door has 13 residency and 11 fellowship programs. Also, about a half a mile away is Radford University Carilion. It is a nursing and allied health sciences college and offers training and education in a number of additional healthcare occupations. And then also here on the same complex is the Fralin Biomedical Research Institute conducting groundbreaking biomedical and clinical research. We also have pharmacies, fitness centers, and other complementary services right here on the complex. And there are countless opportunities for new college graduates. We have research opportunities, internship opportunities, advanced educational opportunities, and we have careers in all fields, even beyond healthcare majors. Carillion hires graduates in accounting, food science, public affairs, education, marketing, engineering, business administration, exercise and sports science, management information systems, and so much more. I want you to know that I'm happy to discuss career opportunities that might interest you. So please feel free to contact me. My telephone number is 540-581-0372, and my email address is nlbishop at carillionclinic.org. Looking forward to talking with you.